Pranam to everybody. It's a good evening to everyone and a good day to talk to all of you. I would have appreciated to see you in person and see your beautiful eyes and faces. But anyhow, it's a COVID time, so here we go, talking across the cameras. Anyhow, life is a blessing. But it doesn't seem until somebody is terminally sick or gets um, in a very, very difficult situation, can be family, emotional, can be marital, can be professional life situations. And it's there where one feels the sheer helplessness of uh, performing or making others happy or making your bosses happy or making your wife or a husband happy and, and raising yourself to the bar which others have set for us. So when all these struggles are happening and amidst this whole commotion enters COVID, enters this corona and comes, then here comes this pandemic which is giving us all, irrespective of what we are, what we do, a new situation, a new challenge. And the one thing which I have observed after listening and talking to hundreds of people, especially in this pandemic, and that is there is a, two fears which are actually taking, um, I would say, a big shape in people's mind. One is of, will I get infected? Second is, uh, will my parents or my spouse or my children uh, be in such a situation? Because the scare is so much, we don't have any cure for that. The vaccine is still far away. And the talk of vaccine is still going on. And we are hoping, fingers crossed, that by February or March, it will be available to the masses, but still, you know, it takes its own good time. The point is that, do we really know how to cope up with this kind of situation where we are scared for ourselves, we are scared for our loved ones, and then comes there where some of the people are losing their jobs or some of the people are you know, being given the pink slips, even in these times. And uh, some of the people have actually gone jobless because of this situation. So there is a huge economic crisis too, which is looming in the heads and minds of the people. So it seems like life is very difficult for, uh, for most of the members of the society. Now about the professionals, like those people who are working in the field, those who are working in public still, those who have to work their job uh, expects them to, to deal with people still in person or have to travel or have to go city to city and, and do their jobs. They are at a much uh, greater risk because when you go out and you see in the airport, people are not behaving properly, meaning not wearing masks, not wearing gloves, not wearing any um, protective measures and not wearing a so-called, I, I don't know, sir, people who are, have to also wear a PPE kit when they travel by air and if your seat is in the center. Now you come out with all the protective gear and there is somebody who is sitting just right beside you without caring about the for social distancing who is absolutely not wearing any protective gear and not even observing the social distancing. So things are really, really scary. Now here comes the wisdom of our sages who uh, long, long ago have taught us, gave us such teachings, gave us some beautiful sutras and some basic fundamental understanding about our own self. When you don't know who you are and when you don't know what your true identity is and when you don't know what life is meant. And on the top, when you think that this is the only one life which you have because there was nothing before and there won't be anything after. So just 
um, 70 or maybe 60 or maybe 80 if we go very liberal there's just 80 or years of life which you have in your hand and if you don't get some uh, other diseases or accident or or you know death by accident happening so in a way short form I would say life is too short and actually nobody is addressing this issue that what about life how did it happen why did it happen and there are some who will just uh, brush it off oh that's not our concern and then there are some who would just read some theories or philosophy about it and yet not go very deeper into it we are so scared of addressing this issue that in a way we are uh, so much distracted with the external uh, work sometime and then we are not thinking about on the correct lines about knowing who I am What is my mind? How does it function? What does my mind really want? And then there is society and there are people around us and who are you know shaping up what you should want and what you should desire what should be your life goals and these days, the life coaches are pretty popular and people pay money to listen to them and learn how to live our life. Now, it's your life, my dear, so you should know how to live your life and why do we need... A... Well, I have nothing against life coaches, but I would still say that when we have the beautiful scriptures of, say, Bhagavad Gita or Katopanishad in our hand or Shvetashwar Upanishad in our hand, when we have beautiful teachings of these great rishis and sages, which are addressing the core questions about, for example, why do we have fear in our mind? I'm not talking about what fears you have. I'm talking about a very basic question. Why do we have fears in our mind? Now, when we don't know what the right answer is, and when we don't know what the truth of this mind is, let me say, what is the form of the mind? One. Two, what is the mechanisms of the mind? Three, what is content of the mind? Four, what can we do to manage this mind? Although people are so worried about managing their funds and finances and jobs and relations and Wives want to manage the husband and husband wants to manage their wives and parents want to manage their children. But nobody is talking about how to manage your own mind. If your mind is filled with fear, fear of unknown, fear of sickness, fear of death, fear of, um, you know, this is a huge uh, load on the head of the mind. And if we could actually understand that ajnana as we say in Sanskrit or ignorance or not knowing is the basic cause of all the fears if I have the answer I'm not saying theoretically I'm saying very realistically and experientially if I know what is mind if I know what mind will be actually happy I'll give you um, um, a situation I would like you to um, think on those lines. For example, if I say, which is the most happiest moment of your life? Um, marriage, dating, mating, food, drinks, going out, visiting Europe, Disneyland, whatnot. You can have hundreds and thousands of answers when I say, what, which was your happiest moment? But I'll just take, say, one situation. I'll pick just one situation that you are in Switzerland with your darling, with beautiful Alps and beautiful streams and wonderful chocolates and coffees and food and nice scenarios and everything is there. For how many hours can you see that beauty? For how many hours can you eat continued, in continuity? For how many hours... Uh, you can have physical intimacy with the with your spouse or girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. After doing all the stuff which I have already mentioned, person wants to hit to the bed. Not literally hitting the head on the bed, but meaning just want to sleep. 
And in the sleep, what you do, you switch off your lights. You don't want to see anything now. You don't want to hear anything now. You don't want to eat anything or taste anything or touch anything. And you close your eyes and in a way you close all your senses. And you cut off yourself from the whole wild, beautiful, ecstatic, enthralling world. And you go into that darkness called sleep. Now in sleep, if you have a light sleep, you are still fidgeting about, you know, how to go more deep and have a good sleep. Now what is good sleep? When there is no dream and when sleep is not light. And in that deep sleep. Now there is nothing worldly over there. It's just you and it's just the darkness of that this sleep and you are just resting. And this rest is so rejuvenating. It kind of refurbishes you. It gives you all the energy. Your, your body cells are working and fixing up itself. You know, if you have a disease or exhaustion or a little bit wear and tear of the muscle or whatever it is. So your body is recuperating, your body is resting and your mind is so calm and happy and patiently happy with its own self. There is no one else. Other person is not there, not food, not a sight, not a smell, not a fragrance, not a touch. Nothing is there. And still, in this deep sleep, your mind is resting so well that it is a hell of a job in the morning to leave the bed and go out and then again have this fight. Fight to fix up lunches and breakfast, fight to reach the office in time, fight to talk to your clients, fight to earn money, fight to solve the relationship issues, fight to make your boss happy, fight to have your targets fulfilled. Now, if I, if I put two things, you know, in comparison, and if I ask you what really makes you happy, what food or intimacy or good sight, smell, sound will do is titillate your sense for some time. Ah, it's great. I'm not denying that there's no joy there. Yes, it is. But where is the real soothing, deep calmness? And that is in your deep sleep. Now, the point is, you cannot deprive yourself of sleep because if you do, then your body will have um, a, a huge uh, surge of hormone called cortisol. And if you're always on this overdrive and over ambitious, pleasing others or running others like puppets, and if you are a boss, then surely I always say the bosses are the most uh, deserving people to whom uh, a subordinate should have sympathy or compassion because that poor chap is running the whole show and in doing that is going through such a stress and so much of cortisol and hypertension and maybe diabetes happening to this person and this person is managing the family and the company and everything and sometimes loses the sleep and here comes the hypertension and diabetes and other lifestyle diseases which you know one after another can really victimize the person. So in a way, my point is that if we could teach all the people, right beginning from the school, that you don't need 10 houses and 20 cars, one girlfriend and one wife. You know, one time a, a man said this to me, that he, he was uh, not yet married and he said, that I'll be really happy if I have a beautiful girlfriend and a beautiful wife at home also. This will make me really, really happy. Well, that's the polygamous mind of the, you know, men sometimes. <laughs> not all men, excuse me, not all men. Um, the more, the better. The more, the better. So all this idea of um, hoarding things and people and friends and money, and in this whole, I wouldn't say rat race, it's a human race. Please don't blame poor rats. They are very wise people. They don't do this kind of races. It is the humans who are doing this kind of races. So when you are in this race, you lose your balance and your whole life is 
too outgoing, too externalized. Hence, too much of pain, too much of misery, too much of anxiety, too much of depression, too much of loneliness. Because when you are fighting with everybody in continuity, uh, you can't have um, a restful sleep and you can't have a, a very good digestive system. And if you are on your tenter hooks all the time, if you are always in a, in, in, you know, uh, the, I would like to use a, a term, that is if you're always in a hurry and you always worry and you always eat hot curry, you cannot have good life. So you have to let go of the worry, the hurry and the curry. And that's where you actually begin to focus on who you are and what you want and what you actually, you know, what makes you really happy. I was just talking to uh, an executive um, and that uh, is that everybody hopes to have a luxurious car. There is nothing wrong in that. You can own one day such a luxury car, but still, I put a hypothetical situation in front of you. One is that you are sitting in a Rolls Royce car driven by a chauffeur. And the second is you with your children and friends are rolling on the grass. What will make you really happy? You know, you're playing on the grass. You're rolling on the grass, you are happy or you're sitting alone with your snobbish nose with your chauffeur. And showing it off to others, but inside you are just an, a lonely guy. So to be happy, you don't need a Rolls Royce. What you need is just roll on the grass. Or maybe swim in the river. And if you don't have an access to a river, then maybe, you know, fill your tub at home. If you don't have a tub at home, doesn't matter. So you can just stand under a shower, close your eyes and visualize, I am under a beautiful Himalayan waterfall. If my thinking and visualization, meaning dreaming and desiring about worldly stuff can, can make uh, me feel inadequate and unhappy. So if I use a good visualization and I use whatever I have around me as a prop to create a beautiful situation in my head, in my mind, what can stop you from being happy? Um, but when we are too dependent on the external people or objects or targets or promotions or that corner beautiful office, you know, where I can see outside. Yeah, it's an it's a office which is a park given to a senior rank uh, officer. So when you are hoping for that, just know it that yes, one day you can sit there, but all that hours of gasping and being jealous and want to be there and can't be there and thinking and it's just ruining your beautiful life. Life is to be lived, work is to be done, sure. When there is no work, how will you earn? And to survive, we do need to earn. We do need to earn money to have our bellies filled and have a roof at our, at our, uh, on our head. And but after that, what? What will make me happy? So if we, I'm, I'm working totally, you know, focused on the outside world and not giving a space to my own self, not giving a space to understand the, the working and the formatting of my own mind, if I don't know how to deal with my own emotions. And about emotions, I would say this is the most disbalancing thing and it is the main cause of many, many diseases occurring in our body. I always say diseases don't happen to us, we create diseases. For example, if you are a very angry person, you injure your liver, right? So you will have high cholesterol, you will have your LFTs going all absurdly wrong. If you are a very um, person who is very prone to sadness and you just feel sad often for whatever reason, it's too hot, uh, it's difficult, it, it's too sharp, it's too much of rain happening, again there is too much cold, 
uh, or or I want like this, my food should be like this, my table should be like this, and when I'm too demanding and I don't get it, I just take that reason to be sad again. Now, if I am too sad, then I'm injuring my heart. I'm injuring my heart. The, our Indian ancient Ayurvedic sciences agree to it, and the traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, philosophy also agrees to this, that sadness injures your heart. Anger injures your liver. Too much of indulgence in food, sex, intimacy, etc. will damage um, your kidneys. Kidneys in the sense, the meridians which are running, the energy which is flowing in your body, that gets impacted. And if we don't do anything about it, then after you know, some years, we will have some anomalies in our organs and it exhibits itself after a few years. It isn't that now I am angry and right away my liver will go berserk. No, no, no. But years of this abuse. Now who is abusing? My mind. What's the tool? Emotions. Now we are all human beings. Obviously we will have some emotions. Obviously we will be angry at somebody. But every time you are angry at somebody, then know it, you are injuring your own liver. Do you want that? Every time you are sad in grief and misery, you are injuring your heart. And every time you are uh, filled with anxiety and filled with uh, continuous thinking, see like when the bulb is on, it is, it is consuming some electricity. Your electricity meter will show it that how much electricity bulbs, a 60 wattage bulb, 100 wattage bulb, 40 wattage. So per minute there is a certain amount of energy which is being consumed by that bulb or whatever electrical appliance it is. Similarly, when we think, we are consuming energy. And when we think too much, we are consuming too much energy. Which means, just sitting on the chair whole day, or sofa whole day, or a very, very plush sofa whole day, yet by the evening you are tired, you are exhausted, and you wonder why. What did go wrong? You didn't do anything, you were just in your air-conditioned office and going through emails and writing some essays or doing some editorial stuff or ordering some stuff for the office supplies and this and that or home groceries and this and that. How can that tire you so much? Well, it will, my dear, because every thought is going to sip into your life force, your prana, your energy, and you waste that. Now, this means we need to put a check on our compulsive and obsessive thinking. I would suggest one simple, it is simple, but if it might not be simple for you, but still I will say it. I give you one simple uh, technique to use. You are in office or you are at home, whatever. You are in a car or a train, whatever. Just close your eyes, count for three and inhale, and count for six and exit. Please don't do it loud. People will think you are crazy. Just do it in your head. For count of three, you inhale. For count of six, you exhale. Maybe you don't close your eyes. Maybe you are not in a position to close your eyes. Then maybe fix your gaze at some one point. You know, maybe in front of your desk, there is a pen or there is something, a photo or a, any blind black gray spot, whatever. But you fix your eyeballs onto that spot you, and try not to blink for that matter, for that little time. So maybe do this for five to ten minutes and done. You are done. Forget about it. And then you go about whatever your work is. But then after another four hours, again, you take a break. You don't have to get out of your office or chair. Right wherever you are, you just again, either close your eyes if possible, an erect spine if possible, or you just keep your spine erect. And then again, you inhale for count of three, and you exhale for count of six. I'm not asking you to do any mantra. I'm just asking you to... 
to breathe properly because this very breath is life. The day breath goes out and doesn't come back, you're dead. People will pack you off and then send you off. So as long as the breath is there, the life is there, so why not enjoy this breath and why not enjoy this life? So you take these small breaks after every three hours or four hours and I'm not asking half and one hour of meditation. It's not even meditation. It's just I would call pranic work. I would call it English breath work. I would call it in Chinese the qi works. We are developing our qi. And you know, when, when you are doing this breathing, my one small suggestion is that you focus on the touch of the air onto your nostrils and you feel the air when it goes in and you feel the air when it comes out. Um, shouldn't be this difficult to do it. Moreover, you are not changing your position or space or you know wherever and howsoever you are sitting. The only t two things which I would uh, recommend is spine is erect. If possible, eyes are closed. And you just feel the air. You know, when somebody has an asthmatic attack, have you ever seen such a person? How they gasp for a single breath. And, and when they can breathe finally, oh, so thankful they are that yes, now they can breathe. So we can breathe. And why can't we use our very breath to bring a calmness while you are in this whole chaotic office and home and society and everything? There are too many things, you know, which you need to address. And I always say the adhyatmic or a true spiritual person is the one who knows to be peaceful and happy by oneself. Doesn't need friend, spouse, family, children, job, salary. Uh, doesn't need all these external objects. See, money can buy you comfort, money can buy you food, money can buy you a roof on your head, money can buy you clothing, yes. But you know what, when you are, when are you the most comfortable? Not in your three-piece suits, not in your designer lehengas, not in your zari saris. Actually, you are the most comfortable when you are using, uh, wearing a, a loose, I think so in Mumbai they call it ganji and in north we call it banyan. You know, a t-shirt and maybe a, a half pajama or bermuda kind of something, which is really worn out. And when you are wearing that stuff, which is cottonish and a nice feel to the skin, you're the most comfortable one. So you actually wear very uncomfortable clothes to fit into the society and parties and make people go, ah, oh, where did you buy this couture? From where did you get this wonderful dress? But actually in your heart you know that you will be most comfortable in your kaftan or your loose cottonish night suit. And true happiness mind you, will come from within, not from outside. Until we understand this, so what we do is like, you know, taraju, like a scale, what we do is this is your professional life and this is your personal life. So to balance these two things, you have to keep your mind in the center. You know the needle of the scale? Let it be in the center. This is when the balance will be. If your mind is too much into the family affairs or sasbau jhagda, or your mind is too much into the office politics, or oh, you are tilting in this side or that side, this will make you very, very unhappy and miserable. So keep your mind in the center. As Buddha says, madhim nikaya, be in the center, follow the middle path. So giving yourself some moments where, like in the deep sleep, there is no one else to bother you, no one else to uh, ask you a question or ask the report or what did you do and why didn't you do and this and that. The moment when you go into deep sleep. So in a way, if we can create that same quiet, silent space in our mind and be with ourselves for a few moments 
you know, 10 minutes I have said, you can do it five, whatever suits you. So for some time, you know, beginning from morning all the way to the time when you say good night, giving these moments to yourself and always seeing the things in, in, in the right perspective, not going overboard, you know, keeping this, uh, I, I, all, I, I would say this, um, you know, mantra, not coming from any Veda, but a simple mantra, and say, ho jayega, you know, ho jayega, no worries, ho jayega. Um, I am not saying that you don't do your work and be lazy and clumsy about it, but I am saying is do your work, but know this, uh, that um, nothing is made in one day. So it's a very progressive work which everyone has to do uh, in, in, in respective fields of their work. So go a little cool. You know, have you seen when people are honking crazy, the light, the traffic light just went green and the person is, you know, like three cars ahead of you. And the person in the fourth row is honking bad, is not giving time to that f uh, the car at the front to move. Well, when first wheel moves, then second, then third, then, then you. But they have to honk. Why? Poor guy is having too much of cortisol running in his blood. And it's, it won't just stop at honking, it might then move into abuse and this and that. And that's what the you know, road rages are happening. And this rage, it's not happening in the road, it's happening in the families, the spouses and children. And they're all engaged into this kind of, wherever you can leak your rage, you know, we are leaking the rages. Wherever you can't, you hold it with yourself. But this rage, when you hold with yourself, it injures you. But when you leak it on others, they will injure you. So now the point is, what is the point of having such anger and rage which will either harm you in this way or that way? So what is the balance? When you meet somebody, like I remember one uh, person asked me that my supervisor is very harsh, very rude. When I see the person, he has a big moustache, I feel like, oh, there's a Ravan coming now. He'll give me hard time, all the time. I do work, I don't do work, I complete, not, doesn't matter. I said, you, okay, you tell me, in your childhood, did you ever go to see Ram Leela? I said, yeah. I said, did you enjoy it? He said, yes. So I said, there you go. Your answer is, when you see your supervisor, no, you are just going to see the new scene in the Ram Leela and the Ravana is going to act for you and that's too for free. You don't have to go anywhere. The free show is going to happen. Why can't we see the life? We have beautiful characters, uniquely different characters around you who are giving us this free show. Please enjoy the show. Don't analyze too much. Don't judge too much. Don't expect too much. Three things. So when you stop analyzing, you stop judging, you stop expecting too much, you will definitely and surely have that tight balance which you deserve to have. Um, work then will become a joy and family will become another joy. So if we can have a joyful life, then why should we go into a lopsided and unbalanced? So where does this balance comes in? It comes from your own mind. So if you apply your mind, you have the balance. So I would say, mind your mind. You know, normally when somebody says harsh and say, don't mind, don't mind. You know, I just joking, I was just joking. But the person on whom this joke happened will definitely mind. But then they say, okay, don't mind, don't mind. Use the same thing for yourself. Say your own name, whatever it is. Say your own name and say, don't mind. People are people. People have tongues. Tongues will wag. People have mind. An uncontrolled and very cluttered and very unmanaged mind. Hence, they can blurt out anything and say out anything. Uh, but if we react on every situation, our balance will go away. So if we keep the balance of our mind in a good scale, meaning in the center, not looping to one side, 
our life will be much, much better, whether it's professional or whether it is personal. And about the fears, about where I started my talk, about the fears. The fears um, will be there as long as we don't understand one small fundamental thing. And that is, for example, I have this flask in my hand. This flask was bought uh, maybe two months ago, was manufactured in 2019 and accidentally I can you know just drop it and it can break and anytime that can happen so this means this flask comes with the date of manufacture and also comes with the date of expiry we don't cry if our flask or glass or vase or dish or plate or mug breaks similarly our human body comes with a manufacturing date. Well, which what you call happy birthday, you know, and you celebrate it nicely. So your body comes with a happy birthday, meaning the manufacturing date, and this also has a date of expiry when it will just crumble and go and will become lifeless like a log of wood. All living sentient beings will die. It's nothing unusual. Not that only others will die and I am not. We haven't drunk any ambrosia, any nectar, which will make us eternal. Nobody is eternal in their body. Great sages, great seers, avatars, mahatmas, prophets came and died, left their bodies. That's a natural phenomenon. Teach your children the truth of the death. Then embrace it. Why fight with it? If this flask breaks down, either I can cry over oh, my lovely flask and I be sad about it or I just get a new one and then be happy because I'll have a new piece. So one body goes, another definitely is there because as long as there are desires in your mind, uh, to fulfill those desires, we would need a body. Whether your religion allows you to believe in this or not, well, that's not my trouble. I'm talking about a phenomenon which has been timely tested, attested again and again and again and again by loads of enlightened beings, whether it is um, Buddhism or Jainism or Hinduism or Sikhism, you know, they all they all agree to one point that one, this body is perishable, two, as long as desires are there, births will be happening, three, until and unless we don't understand what is eternal in our true being, the misery will continue. So if we don't want the misery, have to seek the path of knowledge, have to seek the path of wisdom. And for that, um, I have been trying in my own way, for example, if you have too much of anxiety issue, then with ICMR we did a study on Yoga Nidra and that got published uh, two years ago. And that is if you do Yoga Nidra, there's a 35 minute practice. Your uh, draw scale of anxiety, that says it comes down, your TSH in thyroid comes down, your BP from 170 comes down to 130 to 125. We had 200 subjects in this ICM research. It was almost these went on for six months. We have that scientific research done. You know, when I say something, I say, oh, what, what does he know? So that's why I took this to the ICMR peoples and submitted to them. They took it and did the research and test and the results came out and they were astonished and I'm, I was rather very, very happy that the science fraternity has agreed to what our yogic masters have always been talking about. For yoga nidra, you don't have to go anywhere. You just need the suggestions. You just lie down, do it. And if you can spare 35 minutes every day and you begin to experience a very conscious deep sleep, I'm again saying, a very conscious deep sleep. Well, your life will be flowery, nice, beautiful. And this is not something for which a person has to meet me. We have already made it available on our Amrit Varsha app, available on the iOS 
and the Android phones, you just get that and you get the Yoga Nidra in the meditation section in that, that page and you do it and you, you gain all the benefits and you are happy with your own self and hopefully your subordinates, your colleagues, your family members will also be very, very happy with you. So in the end, I give my good luck to all, all of you and give my good wishes for the beautiful festival of lights coming. So happy Deepavali to everybody. And now I can take your questions as the uh, our person had asked. So I am there for you. Yes, please. Thank you, Guruma. Um, just to ask you uh, a very often asked question, uh, how to stay motivated when a person is not appreciated enough? You know, a person doesn't feel appreciated. <laughs> and how does one keep oneself motivated and centered? <laughs> Yeah. See, I would say, have you ever seen a child who will look in, uh, on, on, uh, look in a mirror and will, will smile and is child always feels I'm the best. Child always feels that whatever I'm doing is good, even if it is a broken poem, but feels good and expects everybody to clap and well, for happiness of child, everybody will do that too. So in a way, if we know how to appreciate and respect and love ourselves, only then, this need, you know, this emotional need, psychological hunger to, to be appreciated by others where, where everybody are actually, you see, so miser to appreciate others. And that's why right from the school nursery to the university, you know, who will come first, who gets gold medal, who gets silver medal. And I think so this creates a very crappy mindset where we need somebody to tell us, oh, you are so good. So why can't we do a simple thing that we do our best and say to ourselves, you are good, because in the whole universe, the thumbprint which you have, nobody has. Nobody has. And you are the bestest, uniquest uh, specimen in this billions of people. So until we appreciate our own presence, my question is, do you enjoy your own presence or not? If you don't enjoy your own presence, nobody will enjoy your presence. And unfortunately, everybody is seeking others' presence to feel good and to feel appreciated only when somebody says, oh, you're looking good or this or that, or you're brilliant or you're smart. or you're... Doesn't matter. So I'll just give example of Picasso. His, his life was you know, riddled with so many difficulties. Uh, and, and he was not that appreciated the way he is being done today. But yet he was happy with himself because he, his happiness was coming from his art. So you, if we are dependent on anybody for this kind of feeling, uh, life will be very, very rotten. So don't rot your life and better have some... Uh, creative juices oozing in your life and, and you you know how to you know bring that happiness in you whether through art form or poem or music or dance or even if you don't know anything then say well if everybody is performing who will listen so I am the listener without me you musicians and dancers are of you know what will you do so somebody has to sit and clap also so be a clapper and, and enjoy, you know, even if you are missing some point, if you, even if you don't have all those good qualities, yet there is one quality which everybody has, and that is that we are alive, and we can laugh, you know, and we can feel joy by seeing a rainbow, by seeing a flower or a butterfly or a, somebody's child. You don't have to bear a child to have that, you know, a good feeling. So it is all about the right mindset. It's not about what others say to me. No, it's all about how I see myself, right? Um, a colleague of ours, uh, by the name Ritu Balotra, wants to know, what are some techniques for stress management? I've already said that, that if you can take this uh, four to six to eight breaks of 10 minutes every day, and just go for the very simple deep breathing. Although I would suggest that the stress will not go. For example, if somebody is poking, you know, with the pencil in your forehead or head again and again and again, what technique would you use to feel calm? 
you will have to stop that person first. So what happens is that we are poking our mind with so many pencils of desires. So we are always unhappy because of that and miserable and sad because of that. So we need to see things in the right perspective and we need to uh, again have Viveka, the right um, ability to discriminate in between uh, dharma and adharma and right and wrong and pap and punya and then follow the path of the dharma and that is you know sometimes i little digress sometimes people ask me that uh, pandavas were dharmic and they suffered so much i said true but did they really suffer when they were 13 years in the forest they had a great time. You know, people, you go today out for picnics for a few days and you say, I felt good. They were 13 years in the jungle, you know, swimming in the streams and eating good fruits and Bhim is getting married and all these adventures are happening. You know, it was like a full on Masti is happening. So don't judge just by saying that they had, you know, no kingdom. So they were unhappy. Uh, but see, our, our sages, our dharma has taught us, and if we are well taught, then we know it, that the joyful life is not when you are in a palace. The joyful life is when you can smile and laugh and be peace with yourself. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, a colleague wants to know, how do we build strong values in children? <clears throat> For that, you will have to spend time with them. Um, these days, I'm working on a new book. I did uh, three comic books for children. Now I am doing a very extensive book and which will come with flashcards and some game also included in that in which there are stories about the childhood of great warriors, great sant, great bhaktas, great kings. You know, we unfortunately have not been exposed to the right historical facts in our history books, in our schools. So somehow we have missed those great people who have lived in our country. So I am trying to assemble these all great people and write down a, a storybook which is not a, a fiction, which is not just a myth, which is you know, about people who were in flesh and bones and how they lived their life. So when we, we, we will be talking this stuff to our children, Definitely that will sow the seed of goodness and also the knowledge about not being bad. Uh, so uh, Ravan, although in every Dishaira we are burning the effigies, but the truth is that he was a very wise and very learned person. And it's when Sri Ram comes back and Mata Koshalya, mother asked that, um, did you kill that bad Ravan? How did you do that? And Sri Ram then says that, he was a Chaturvedi who knew all the four Vedas. He was a great devout of Shiva. He was a great writer. He was a great warrior. He was a great king. He had great uh, arts to him. And he was a great literary person. And I had to uh, kill him because of the situation. But he never said a bad thing about Ravana. And sometimes I really wonder that what kind of this great person was actually Ravana. And no wonder in South India they don't burn any effigy of Ravana. He was a great uh, literary Brahmin, uh, devout Shiva Bhakta. So the thing is, what, what is good? What is bad? And also that if you have all the good qualities, but yet if you have ego, and if you disrespect a woman, you get punished. You know, being unbiased. Like Mahabharata, it's a great epic. You know, our children should be taught about Mahabharata. Uh, about Mahabharata, the author himself says that there is nothing in this world which is not in this scripture. So you can learn everything from that scripture. And when we talk about these things to our young minds, they imbibe those great qualities and then those great people will become their role models. Not Harry Potter, unfortunately, just a fiction. <laughs> yes. um, just one final question, Guruma. Uh, some people want to know uh, about sleep. 
you mentioned about yoga nidra, how yeah. helpful it is to yeah. uh, de-stress ourselves. But yeah. regarding sleep per se, how many hours and how much and when? And there are a lot of people who work in shifts. So yes. there's uh, Praveen Kothwal from my office who wants to know people working in shifts, how do they get enough sleep? Yeah. Uh, two things I would like to say, actually uh, it's uh, more than two things, but I'll say there are two factors. One is your physical and one is your mental. If you have um, uh, muscle wear tear pains in your body or bones or ligaments or you have too much acid in your uh, stomach or if you have too much, again, because of worry, anger, too much of cortisol in your body, if your liver is heated up, again TCM, acupuncture term I'm using, if your liver is heated up, um, if your liver is loaded with cholesterol, uh, this will give you a disturbed sleep. Second is the emotional uh, garbage which we are carrying on our minds, the unnecessary thinking, too much of desires, too much of anger, too many prejudices, too many, uh, the rush which is there in the mind. So if the mind is with so much of load, the sleep will be really, really far off. So we have to address the two things. So for the body, your asanas, you should learn asanas, 30 to 40 minutes of asana practice must. It will take care of your wear, tear, muscle, joint, bones, you know, and give you a very good digestive system. Two for the body is that you eat good, you eat right, and you don't eat, say, after 6 or 7 p.m., because if you sleep at 10 or 11, then at least 3 to 4 hours of gap should be there in between your dinner and in your sleeping hours. Uh, some kind of pranayam, some kind of mantra, some kind of uh, breath work is very, very important to have a good mental health. And giving yourself those mini, minuscule breaks of 10 minutes every three to four hours is very, very important. And somehow, if you can't do anything else, then please maybe create a habit of that switching off your phones. I know the professional people don't like to listen to this, but still I would say that half an hour or maybe one hour before your sleep, you just switch off your phones and your laptops in a snooze mode and you dim your light and you listen to some very soothing evening ragas, the Indian ragas. Please don't listen to rock and roll at that time, yeah? Or anything rap kind of thing. Just something soothing, you know, some Indian classical music. Preferably, I would say, listen to flute, the bansuri or listen to some great classical maestros. So just listening to that sound and having an equal synchronized breathing while listening to the classical music will also do wonders for you. But still I would suggest if you can do some mantra chanting and I, um, in Ayurveda, uh, you know, the suggestions are, which I often say to people is, and that is to uh, rub your earlobes, soles of the feet, with coconut oil, preferably cold-pressed coconut oil, and putting two drops in your nose, in one drop in your ears, and maybe one small teaspoon on your top of the head. Massaging the head, massaging the earlobes, massaging your soles. After, obviously, washing your you know, hand and feet and your face and you do this little small oil application and then sitting down for some time, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, whatever, breathing deep, forgive everybody and forgive yourself. Huh? <laughs> forgive everybody and forgive yourself and just do deep breathing. If you are a religious person, then maybe do your mantra at that time in the breath and then just lie down if you take care of these two things. Although in these two, there were many, many more things which you need to do. Um, a yoga nidra is not to be done at the night time. Yoga nidra's uh, objective is that you do it in the daytime and you are not to, not to sleep actually when you do the yoga nidra. The whole challenge is that you are up consciously, but you allow your subconscious you know, to go into that uh, sleep mode. So it's an active sleep, I say. 
conscious sleep so you don't doze off and snore then it will be just nidra not yoga nidra so yoga nidra is to be done in the daytime when you are not tired or exhausted or your stomach is full okay thank you so much for your time to take a time out from your busy schedule yeah uh, to teach us some very important life lessons and uh, I think if we might even a few from the uh, tips and the techniques that you've taught us, I think we'll be able to see through thick and thin. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.